everyone, it's Emily bringing you another Grass River micro class. Um, greetings on this kind of rainy, cloudy, foggy morning. Um, I'm right outside the center right now. Um, and today I wanted to talk to you about the relationship between milkweed and the iconic monarch butterfly. Um, so milkweeds um, are a genus of plants. Um, the genus name is Asclepius, um, which is named after the Greek god of healing and medicine, Asclepios, um, because I guess apparently some milkweed species were used um, to treat um, illnesses and different injuries um, back in the day. So genus Asclepius, um, and there are dozens of um, native species of milkweed to the United States. In Michigan, we have 11 native species, but there are really only three that we see up here often. Um, common milkweed, swamp milkweed, and then butterfly weed, also known as butterfly milkweed. Um, so the relationship between milkweeds and monarchs is incredibly important. Um, monarch populations have declined by over 90% in the last 25 years, which is a huge decline. And there are a lot of factors playing into that, but one of the main ones is um, the decrease in um, milkweed plants. And milkweed is so important for monarchs because plants in the genus Asclepius are the only plants that monarchs, um, that monarch caterpillars eat. So they are a host plant, that's where monarchs lay their eggs. Also on a few other species of plants in the dogbane family, but mostly on milkweeds. Um, and that's the only thing that monarch caterpillars eat. And the flowers are a really good source of nectar for the adults as well. Um, so, we're gonna learn about how to identify the three major um, types of milkweed that we have up here. And then we'll talk a little bit more about um, how milkweed benefits monarchs in other ways. All right, with that background, let's go see which plants we can find. All right, so this is common milkweed, the one you are probably familiar with. Um, it's a pretty tall plant. It can get up to five feet in height with a really thick stem. It's got these thick leaves um, that are a little fuzzy um, and they've got this nice kind of reddish colored midrib running through them. Um, and the leaves are opposite. You can see they come out of the opposite sides of the stem on the same level. Um, and the flowers up here are actually pretty complex. Um, and they're always in what's called an umbel. Um, so it's kind of a ball of flowers that where the little stems come out of the same spot um, and kind of in like a big globe shape. And if you break a piece of um, this milkweed off, you'll see a um, milky, which is where it got its name, sort of uh, like latex-like sap and it's sticky. So we're just gonna take a small leaf off and check it out. So this white latex that the plant exudes um, anywhere that it's broken. You can see that right there. And we'll talk about um, what is contained in this sap and why it's beneficial for monarchs. And all right, and this is butterfly milkweed, or butterfly weed, simply. Um, you can see the flowers are this gorgeous orange color as opposed to the kind of muted rose color of the common milkweed. Um, and it's much shorter um, and more bushy than um, the common milkweed is. But they do grow in similar habitats. Both of these are growing right outside the center right now, um, so sort of like um, in fields or open areas, they really like um, lots of sun and they can tolerate pretty dry soils. Um, so if we zoom in, let's take a look at um, the butterfly weed's leaves. So if we take a close look at the leaves here, we can see that they're really closely packed in next to each other um, and they're not opposite. They're, these leaves are coming out of not the same level of the stem. Um, they're kind of alternating like in a ladder sort of way as you go from down, up, up, up. 
So here's our last species of milkweed that's common up here in northern Michigan. This is swamp milkweed, and like its name suggests, it likes to grow in wet soils. So we have this one growing in our rain garden um, near the center, but it also grows um, out in the wetter areas um, along the Sedge Meadow Trail. Um, and like the common milkweed, it is taller and more spindly, less bushy than the butterfly weed. Um, and its leaves are opposite. They come out of the same spot on either side, um, same level of the stem. Um, and the flowers are really beautiful, um, more vibrant pink than common milkweed. These can be really bright magenta, just starting to open here. Um, same umbel shape um, as the other milkweeds. And like common milkweed, this milkweed, when you break a piece off, it does exude that sort of white um, latexy substance that's toxic. Okay, so now that we have an idea of how to identify the three um, most common species of milkweed up here, let's dig deeper into why this is beneficial for monarchs to eat this plant. Now, first of all, we've been talking about how that milky sap that contains those toxic compounds called cardiac glycosides, that that is toxic to most animals. So, of course, it's advantageous um, as any type of herbivore to be able to eat um, a plant resource that other herbivores can't because then you have much lower competition um, for your food than you would otherwise. So that's a huge boon. But um, you might have heard that monarchs um, are, they, they kind of store these chemical defenses in their tissues and so then that makes them unpalatable to bird predators, which is true. So why exactly is that? How does that work? It has to do with how these compounds affect um, how nerve cells um, and like how our, cell, how our cells contract, how they send electrical impulses. So without getting too much into like the biochemistry of it, suffice it to say that in order for nerve cells to fire or for like heart, cell, heart muscle cells to contract, um, what happens is that sodium enters the cell and creates a charge and that creates the electrical discharge. Um, and so there's a very special protein in our cells called a sodium pump. Um, and basically its job is when sodium enters the cells in order to cause um, that electrical discharge that creates our nerve cells to fire or our heart muscles to contract. Um, when the sodium enters the cells, that sodium pump's job is to pump it back out. Um, and so then the cell is ready again to receive more sodium in order to fire. Um, so what these, um, so what these um, cardiac glycosides do is they um, bind to the sodium pump and basically don't let it pump the sodium back out, which um, stops, which doesn't allow the nerve cells or the heart muscles um, to contract in a normal way. So what, what the body does is put more and more sodium in in order to get those cells to fire or contract. And oftentimes that can cause um, like your heart, heart muscle cells to um, fire uncontrollably. And so that causes um, your heart to beat out of control, um, which is how uh, this compound gets its toxicity. Um, so if you or I or a bird or most animals were to eat milkweed, um, it would make us very sick, it would make us vomit, but if we ate enough of it, it would cause our heart to beat out of control and it could cause death. So that's where the toxicity comes in. But monarchs have this really cool mutation in their genes um, that makes it so that these cardiac glycosides cannot bind to their sodium pumps so it doesn't affect them. Um, so they are able to use this defense and they're able to store up these cardiac glycosides in their tissues, which makes um, them taste really bad and it makes them poisonous and toxic to animals that eat that would otherwise eat them and so this strategy you have to think about it only works if like animals like birds learn that oh that animal tastes bad because if it eats you and then it you know throws you back up or whatever it makes the animal really sick that doesn't really help you as like your individual monarch so what monarchs have done 
um, is evolved what's called aposematic coloration, which is just a fancy term to mean that they're really bright warning colors that is signaling to birds or other predators that might eat them like, hey, I'm toxic, I taste bad, you don't wanna eat me. Um, and what's interesting is that not just monarchs have evolved this aposematic coloration, these, these um, like striking bold patterns of orange and black, um, but so have other species of insects that feed on milkweed that have the same genetic mutation that allows them to store these toxins in their bodies. So we're talking things like milkweed bugs, um, milkweed tussock caterpillars. Um, so, you know, all of these animals are collectively signaling to would-be predators, don't eat me, I'm toxic. Um, so. That's the complicated relationship between monarchs and milkweed. Um, and again, it's really important that um, we do everything in our power to keep milkweed around. Um, so you can plant it in your garden, the seeds and even the plants are readily available from nurseries. Just make sure you're planting one of the native species of milkweeds up here. And if you're getting the plant from a nursery, make sure it hasn't been treated with insecticide because that would be really the opposite effect that we want to have, right? We want to help monarchs not harm them. Um, and I should mention that milkweed is not just beneficial to monarchs, but in addition to all of those other species we talked about that eat milkweed, um, a lot of animals, um, insects um, like bees, ants, wasps, other butterflies, um, beetles, they they drink the nectar of the flowers because that is not toxic, that does not contain the cardiac glycosides. Um, so not only is milkweed beneficial for monarchs, but other um, insect pollinators as well. Um, all right, plant milkweed. All right, everybody, that's it for today. Thanks for bearing with me on that crazy biochemistry, that co-evolution between milkweed and monarchs that I think is really cool. I hope you do too. Um, again, plant your milkweed. Um, don't weed it out of your garden. If it's there, leave it there. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, I will see you guys next week. Bye.